<laughs> I have a friend who I think is just a very brave. Uh, my friend's name is Corey Miller. He's going to speak to us tonight on the topic of LGBTQIA, MAP, and more. There's just more all the time. He's the president and CEO of Rashio Christie. What you may not know about him is that when he was a little child, he rode on the back of a Harley Davidson that was owned by a member of the Hells Angels. Yes. He grew up in Utah where he was uh, like all, everybody in that culture. It seems like a, a Mormon background. And he studied biblical studies. He studied philosophy. He got a PhD. He was pursuing, got a master's at Purdue, pursuing a PhD there. Ended up finishing that PhD, I believe, in Oxford. Is that right? I think I'm looking at your thing. I'm doing this from memory. I hate reading bios when it's somebody I know personally. But anyway, Corey <laughs> is speaking on this subject tonight, and I know he's going to be speaking at it in Hawaii coming up next week and has been asked to come to Uganda as well. I'd like to go to Uganda with him because, you know, my, my wife and I ministered in Zambia, Africa for a number of years. But anyway, Corey's going to address a, a rather challenging subject and pray that you will uh, give him your complete detention. Uh, detention. <laughs> That was from the Hell's Angels days. <laughs> now attention as a truth teller. So uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Miller. Hey. Thank you, Corey. Oops. All right, well. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be with you guys tonight. Um, the topic is one that you, everyone feels like they're walking on eggshells with in our culture. This is one that has got such political volatility, no one wants to discuss it. If you um, care about the people that uh, are your loved ones because they will disown you, you might disown them you might just take one another's heads off in the process. Uh, in the corporate world, it doesn't work either, usually unless you are taking one particular side because the, the wind is uh, at the back of a particular understanding of this issue. But what we are going to do is to try to address this issue from an angle like Paul would have in the book of Acts. When Paul was speaking to... Uh, fellow Jews, like himself as a fellow Hebrew, he would take the Old Testament and he would try to persuade them. He would reason with them from the scriptures to show that Christ was the Messiah. Um, there was the, this assumption that people knew about the Bible. They knew about God. They had a, a, a theistic or Jewish, even now Christian ethic, and they knew all the stories. And so he would just slap this final piece on and say that you've heard about the Messiah, Christ is the Messiah, and you just need to repent and, and do business with Christ. When he got to the book of Acts chapter 17, there was a different story. He's now with the Greeks. He's in Mars Hill. He's got Stoic philosophers, Epicurean philosophers, the you know materialist atheist and the pantheist and these people with all these other gods, and he couldn't really take the Bible because you know, and talk about the man in the book, because people say, you want me to believe the man? Yes. But the man is in the book. Yes. Well, I don't believe the book. And so Paul had to say, okay, I'll put the book behind me here. I'm going to be biblically informed. But with a different audience, with an Acts 17 audience on Mars Hill, I need to come with reason. And this is fitting with something like um, Francis Bacon, who was the father of modern science, once said that, there are two, the two books of God, the book of Scripture and the book of nature, or God's work and God's word, and never the twain shall contradict. Now, if there are ever contradictions, they aren't at the level of the facts themselves, Scripture or nature, but at the level of the interpretation of the facts, theology and science, which are interpretations, models, abstractions of the reality, right? Paul was dealing with this particular issue of God's existence using reason for these people and scripture for these people. 
We are living in an Acts 17 culture now in America and in the West, and this issue in particular is one that doesn't come along with a lot of friendliness uh, unless you take a, a particular position. And so the title uh, is going to be Reclaiming Marriage. We're dealing with marriage, LGBTQQIAA, MA, <laughs> P, which stands for minor attracted persons. And you want to know whether or not scripture has anything to say on this, and you want to know what about what culture says about love is love, and why is it that Bible-believing people who affirm the scriptures have so much hate? They're so bigoted. They won't listen to the science. They're just rooted in this book, right? And then it's not just the book, because now there is a new book, and this little title here, you can't see it, but it's called the Queen James Bible, 2012 edition, and it was made in honor of King James, who is said to have been bisexual. And instead of the King James Version, it's the Queen James Bible, 2012, where virtually everything else is supposed to be the same, except for the six or so passages that need fixing, right? And when you go through here, of course, you find out that they don't even get the right books of the Bible correct. Um, and then you have to move on from there for interpretation. But we're even dealing with things at that level now. So um, I'm going to assume for most of the night, we'll start out talking about marriage and the value of marriage and the value not just for individuals and couples and children and civilization as a whole. Um, but then we'll move on to talk about a different view of marriage, a polyamorous kind of a view of marriage. And so um, I'm going to figure out how to do uh, this new technology with my phone tonight. This will be great. So we begin with marriage. Marriage is, and this is how we define it, uh, my ministry is Ratio Christi that I, I um, have friends that are here working with and that we've got on our web page, but marriage is a covenantal union ordained by God of one adult biologically born male and one adult biologically born female for the purposes of natural sexual reproduction, faithful intimate union, and in, in forms or forms the most basic societal institution and protection for human good. And when we first look at marriage in Genesis 2.24, it talks about how uh, Adam was alone, and it was not good to be alone, and he took one man out of man's side and created a couple, and uh, the text reads that the two came together as one flesh. God made man in his image. He made them in his image. Male and female, he created them, right? And then we find, when we get to Matthew 19 that I reference here, Jesus is dealing with this, and some people say, look, Paul was a homophobe in the New Testament. Uh, he mentions it three different places in um, Romans 1, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but Jesus never said anything about it. And some people think that Jesus himself was even gay, with John the Beloved laying his head on his, on his breast and so forth, but Jesus never said anything about this. But in fact, Jesus did. He alludes back to Genesis reclaiming marriage as it was from the beginning when people were asking him about the rules of divorce. And at the time you had the school of um, you know, Hillel and the school of Shammai and, and all these different justifications one could use for divorce. And Jesus said from the beginning, it was not uh, like that. Uh, what God has brought together, let no man separate. It was because of hardness of hearts that Moses gave a certificate of divorce. But he brings them back to the one flesh in Genesis 2.24. And then you have Paul where he's talking about uh, the relationship of husbands and wives and the mutually reinforced submission here. And um, he gets to a point where he talks about um, this submission and quotes again Genesis 2.24 and then says, but I'm talking about this great mystery, the mystery being Christ in the church. Well, so he does two things there. One, he goes back to Genesis again. 
the same as Jesus did before him, to the natural order of things, to nature, not just scripture, but the way that God had formed them to come together in a natural uh, symbiotic union and a reproductive, uh, with reproductive potential as well, right? But in the Old Testament, God was looked at as the bridegroom and Israel was the bride. In the New Testament, Christ was the bridegroom and the church was the bride. And so what marriage is, marriage here is merely a shadow of our ultimate relationship corporately with the people of God and God. It's that type of a union, okay? Now, there's a book I love on marriage that I've taken philosophers through, I've taken small groups through, I've done premarital counseling with it. What if God designed marriage for the, uh, the purpose of you know, making us holy more than happy? It's called Sacred Marriage. And when I moved here in 2004, I took a group of philosophers and their wives through it at Purdue, and it begins on page one with a quote from Socrates. By all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you find a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> Uh, our wives loved that one. Um, in truth, uh, in all my study of Greek philosophy, which was a focus of mine at Purdue, I don't think Socrates probably ever said that. Uh, there are some things about his wife or uh, whatever, but I, I don't think he was the one who said that. Um, when it comes to marriage, um, in our, our modern culture, unsurprisingly, 40% of all engagements happen between Thanksgiving and Valentine's Day. So, um, you know, Tomorrow, I think, is Valentine's, right? We've already been taking our, our significant others out for brunch or dinner, uh, hoping we can head, head that off and, and not be in the doghouse when we forget about Valentine's. Um, but, you know, if you miss it, hey, you can try again next year. But 40% of all engagements will have taken place by the beginning of this week and over the last couple of months. Uh, today, the median age of marriage is 29 with women, 30 with men. I was one of those Valentine's ones in, in the sense that, um, you know, I met my wife. Uh, we got together for a week. I flew out of state. Six weeks later, I came back, and that day, I was Valentine's weekend. I asked her father for permission, and then that night, I asked her to marry me. And then the next day I took off again out of state to go back to school up in the Northwest and came back a week before the wedding. Don't try this at home, kids, right? <laughs> Today the median age is 29 and 30. We were 19 and 21. And we're often told to wait until around age 30 to curb for divorce. And two reasons for that, career and fear. You got to get your career off, off you know, to a good start and get grounded uh, in your career, and then maybe get married and, and maybe have one kid at that point, maybe two. It's not good for economics. It's not good for a nation for re reproducti uh, reproductivity. Um, not good for Social Security in being able to replenish those who are workers, but it is what it is in our culture right now. The other one is fear, and it's fear of getting divorced. You know, as Chris Rock once said, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? And so what our culture has opted for is somewhere in the middle, is a happy middle, um, cohabitation, shacking, living together before marriage, or maybe you just don't worry about, you know, uh, marrying at all. Well, today, 50% plus cohabitate together before marriage. In 1960, this was virtually unheard of. Today, the divorce rate is twice that of 1960. Hmm. In 1960, 72% of American adults were married, but that is less than 50% today. In 1970, nearly 90% of births were in marriage, but today less than 60% are in a wedlock situation. So divorce rates are really high, it's true, but the highest are those who are either, one, they marry before age 18 and or have dropped out of high school and or have a baby out of wedlock. And everyone knows that fatherlessness is the greatest predictor of poverty. And this cycle repeats itself. Those who come from broken homes will have that much more likelihood 
that they themselves will initiate or go into broken homes and continue the poverty route. You want to help the poor? Think about marriage as an institution for civilization. Research shows that those who marry young without cohabiting actually have some of the lowest divorce rates. In a recent Wall, uh, Wall Street Journal article that taps into uh, Center for Disease Control, I know it sounds weird for them to have uh, you know, information like this, but taps into 50,000 women surveyed in the ages of 22 to 30 on this issue. Further, children who grow up in married two-parent families have two to three times more positive life outcomes than those who do not. Marriage isn't about me. Some people think it is, and that's the problem. That is the fundamental problem that leads to divorce so much. It's about me being satisfied. It's about you changing and me getting what I want. I didn't sign up for this that you're not giving me what I want. It's not about me. It's about we. And ideally, marriage takes three. It's about holy matrimony. It's sacred. Marriage can be tough. Anyone who's been married knows that marriage can be tough. But what if God designed marriage more so to make us holy than to make us happy? Or what if holiness and happiness as concepts were actually themselves married? as they were from the Greek tradition onward up until Romanticism. And this was a concept of shalom in the Old Testament. Happiness and holiness were not divorced. They were married. What if both spouses saw our obligation before God, till death do us part, Romans 6, to serve rather than to be served? What if I had that view with my wife? And what if my wife had that view with me? See, marriage is ultimately a spiritual growth context because there's no context in the world that will reveal and challenge your selfishness more. And so what will you do with that knowledge? And that's where Paul culminates uh, Ephesians um, you know, 5 with this idea that husbands ought to be treating their wives like Christ taught or treated the church, right? And that we ought to have mutual submission in that we're submitted with God. And so I have found this, even though marriage has been hard for me at times too, that my wife and I are happiest when both of us are closest to God. Married couples on average have far more wealth at the end of their lives than otherwise, enabling the passing on of wealth to the next generation. Marriage and growing up in stable marriage boosts our well-being, the good life for individuals, and for society. Marriage between a man and a woman is good for couples. It's good for kids, and there's a whole lot of information on that, and good for civilization. Now let's move forward out of just marriage, the truth of marriage from the biblical text, and I'm not gonna get into all the disputes on, on the theological texts there. There's enough room for that to have an entire 600 page book on. But we're going to talk about truth and political truth. You need to know the difference, just like there's science and political science, right? There's justice and there's social justice. And those aren't necessarily the same things. Truth is real. It's objective. And we can look at different formations or, or um, aspects of truth, mathematical, scientific, religious, ethical. For example, a mathematical truth would be two plus two equals four. We can know that with absolute certainty. Or the laws of logic that they apply to reality. Scientific truth, life travels at 160 or 86,000 miles per second. Water is essentially H2O. Religious truths, if God is the creator, then God was not created. Um, ethical truths, clubbing homosexuals with a bat over the head just for fun is evil objectively so. I used to challenge my ethics students at Indiana University with that to disabuse them of moral relativism on the first day of class. How many of you think it's okay to bash a homosexual over the head with a big bat just for fun? Somebody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? No one would raise their hands. Not because they just didn't want to get caught as someone who felt like that, and there are those few people who still may feel like that, because we all know that that is wrong. 
there are things we can't not know, and those are things that make up the fundamental moral law. And if you have a moral law, that implies a moral law maker, and many people just don't like the implications of that. But truth is also knowable. Uh, proof, you can say that truth exists, and someone challenges you on it, and they say, there are no truths. Well, either that statement is true, that there are no truths, which means there's at least one truth, so it's false, or that statement's false, that there are no truths, which means that there are truths. In logic, it's called the reductio ad absurdum. Um, the idea that truth is real and knowable is quite obvious and demonstrable. And we can know this just by the fact that we have technology. We've gone to the moon. Uh, Purdue University nearby has the first and last astronaut who ever walked on the moon, and one out of 50 engineers in the country have come from Purdue, and that's the astronaut school. We've developed technology because our, our knowledge of the world has enabled us to make inferences that then build further knowledge campaigns, right? Truth is exclusive of error. So when people say, you need to be more inclusive, or don't be so dogmatic, well, look, you don't need to take this personal. That's the very nature of truth. Truth is exclusive to error. If 2 plus 2 equals 4, it does not mean it equals 5 or 3 or any other potentially infinite number. It's 4. I'm sorry if I'm a mathematical bigot, but that's what it equals, right? Truth is defined as that which corresponds to reality, not that which my peers will let me get away with, as one philosopher of moral relativism and other kinds of relativism would say. Truth and tolerance, a pre-modern or a modern view versus post-modern. We live in a post-modern world today. A pre-modern or modern view is that, and I'm sorry if you can't read these, <laughs> I, I thought I made the font sizes bigger, but hopefully they'll, they'll appear on uh, live stream for people who are watching when we, we get those connected with them. But truth is objective, and people are equally valued. Biology is not bigotry. It's just science. And so if there is a biological fact to the matter, when we get to issues of sexuality and gender, just relying on the facts, the truth of science, doesn't make you a bigot. It just makes you one who listens to the science. Postmodernists say that truth is my truth. You do your truth, I'll do my truth, which means there is no truth. But we've already done away with that. That's impossible. It's necessarily false that there is no truth. Truth is my truth. Truth is your truth. It's by lived experience. That's how I know truth. The pre-modern or modernist says that the elitist, that we should be elitist with respect to ideas, but equalist or egalitarians with respect to people. As the skeptic Voltaire once said, I disagree with what you say, but I would defend to the death your right to say it. That's the pre-modernist and the post-modernist. We believe not in cancel culture, but in allowing people to debate, because debate does not hate. But for the postmodernist, they don't believe in tolerating the intolerant. Stalin once said that ideas are more powerful than weapons. We don't allow our enemies to have weapons. Why should we let them ideas have ideas? That's the heart of cancel culture. It's Marxism, and it's taking over our universities and taking over our culture. For the pre-modernist, we used to say theologically, love the sinner and hate the sin. Disagreement does not entail denigration. But for the postmodernist, they can't accept that. Sinner and sin are inseparable. I am my ideas. I am my behavior. Either hate or celebrate. Which one will you be? So then we reach political truth and polyamory. If all truth is relative, and it's not, we already did away with that, maybe there's a species of truth that is, and they would say that's moral truths, but we have this issue of political truth, which is sort of like political correctness. It doesn't mean it's necessarily true, it's just what the powerful push in their propaganda um, through agendas and make us all believe, and sometimes we live in make-believe land. Political truth and polyamory. Amora is the Latin word for love. Many loves. 
love is love, right? Love is love. And so if you've ever seen this show, Sister Wives, right, on Netflix or something like that, you had this polygamous family that uh, one guy, four wives, and why not? Why not? I watched one episode and I saw a new family join them for vacation. They were going to Las Vegas. And two out of the three wives I instantly recognized. I grew up with them. Three houses down in Utah. They were twin sisters. Why not? Why not? On Valentine's Day, a couple of years ago, you had the first thruple. Three married men in Thailand. Happy Valentine's. It's another picture here on the right, top right. Or in the top middle, why bother getting married at all? We want to practice platonic parenting. It has tens of thousands of people joining websites now. Where rather than doing it in a Petri dish, you do it in a hotel room and you find each other and you come to a contractual agreement that we want to have a child and we will live within a relative vicinity and we will split 50-50 so it won't be like a bad divorce and we'll just agree that we're never getting married, we'll never have romance or intimacy, it's strictly platonic, we'll, have, we'll be shared parents with this child. That's growing in popularity. Or what about LGBT QQIAA MAPS? MAPS, right? Minor attracted persons. You don't want to say pedophile anymore because that's now a hate word. Minor attracted persons. What's good for the ordinary gay goose should be good for the new gay gander with certain age expansions. It's true for the Greeks, true for the Romans. Why not? Why be so bigoted and limit us? Or why not move down the road to the next man here who's the most famous moral philosopher alive today. I've been to his office, went there to interview him at Princeton University, Peter Singer, who not only supports things like euthanasia, but also bestiality, zoo zoophilia, intercourse with animals. He says, so long as it's mutually consensual, have you ever heard that before? And there's no harm inflicted on the animal. And you think, this is crazy, this is crazy. Hawaii just made that activity illegal eight months ago. <laughs> State of Washington, it was, it was legal until 2006, and Washington still is the number one state of practice. But in 2006, the legislature had to do something about it because there was an entire commune practicing it, and one man was at the receiving end with a horse who found it consenting and died. So the legislature passed a law. You do your truth, I'll do my truth. Why not? What's the limit? friend of mine in this community, we used to get lunch together about once a year, and he's gay, gay cleric. Um, and I asked him, and I was trying to unpack some of the letters from LGBTQQIAA, and he laughed and he said, yes, I know, we're always trying to add letters to it. And I said, what about MAP? He said, MAP, and I said, minor attracted persons put his hand on his head, looked down, and he, he gasped, and he, he goes, I know, I know, I see where the logic goes with this, but there's just something about that that viscerally tells me that's just wrong. On what ground? Where is the moral law with which to adjudicate wrong from right on any ground of sexual intercourse? Or the final picture, and we're just talking good heterosexuality, a little promiscuity here. The guy's with his girlfriend, and he's looking back going, ooh, look at that hot thing. And she's looking at him going, what? Look, it's just my orientation to be a cheater. That's my preference. That's my desire. That's my truth. 
That's who I am. I'm born that way. A cheater. Why not? The public relations war, truth, and the rhetoric of LGBTQQIAAMAP. Abraham Lincoln once said, in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. Without it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. It's all about the emotions. It's all about the emotions, the passions, right? So when it comes to rhetoric or the art of persuasion, oftentimes we try to persuade people purely by logos or logic. Oftentimes we do so by ethos or ethic or character or trustworthiness, reliability, trustworthiness. But another way is through pathos, empathy, right? That's how we sometimes feel for people who are down and out and we want to have compassion for them. Empathy, empathos. This victim culture that we've gone into and one that's within human sexuality and gender that's capitalized is to rule the sentiments of the populace through rhetoric, through empathy, through claiming victimhood, and that drives support for the victim and, and pushes the other uh, person in the direction of being the victimizer, right? So I offer this disclaimer that I gave the first time I ever debated a homosexual philosopher which was in Utah many years ago. And I illustrate it similar to um, being addicted to crack cocaine. Now imagine this. Imagine you're the oldest sibling growing up, but you've got several younger siblings. Your next to oldest is addicted to crack cocaine. Moreover, he's stealing mom and dad's family heirlooms and selling them for drug money, and he's getting your younger siblings involved in it as well. Tell me now, what would be the most loving thing to do? One, live and let live. Different strokes for different folks. To each their own. Indifference. Or two, we live in a liked culture. You want to see how many likes you get on Facebook. You know what's going to get you liked here. Your brother's birthday is coming up, and you buy him a bag of cocaine. Right? Celebrate. Celebrate his cocaine addiction. Or three, because you love him, don't take the biggest Bible you can find and whack him over the head. Instead, wrap your arms around him and say, please, please, because I love you, stop this. You're leading to um, a harmful life for yourself, an early death, harmful life for our siblings. You're stealing from mom and dad. Please, stop. Which of those would be the most loving thing to do? Which would be the most cocaineophobic? If anything, one or maybe two, the indifferent one or the one who celebrates is the true cocaineophobe. The only one who truly loves his brother is the one who tells his brother the truth in love, right? You need to remember that illustration because it's similar to homophobia. One group of people are called homophobic, and they aren't necessarily homophobic. Some might be. The other group, often calling the one group homophobic, are actually the ones who are homophobic. And I'm going to show you that tonight because I'm going to be focusing a lot of my attention on the biomedical argument from harm. Like cocaine, homosexuality has certain aspects to it that demonstratively harm people. So let's move to the homosexuality and the born this way argument. Lady Gaga's song, no matter if you are gay, straight, or bi, lesbian or transgendered life, you are on the right track, baby, because God makes no mistakes. You was born this way, baby. Don't hide yourself in regret. Just love yourself and you're set. Born this way by Lady Gaga.
four prongs to this argument, one that I would give to my students at Indiana University. The argument from um, compassion, this one might be a, a, set, uh, a set on the argument from religion. Homosexuality is ungodly, or if there is no God in the religion, because not all religions have a God, like Buddhism, we'll call it ungoodly. And this is the idea that from all major religions, East and West, they condemn or fail to condone homosexuality. I won't spend a lot of time on that because that would take a lecture in itself, uh, but I'm gonna take that for granted. East and West, they either condemn mostly in the West or fail to condone in the East on the basis of the do no harm principle. Um, the do no harm principle we find in the silver rule, don't do to others what you don't want others to do to you. But the golden rule steps up with love, do to others what you want them to do to you. In the Bible, um, we have now a cultural rather than textual um, changes that explain the biblical justification of homosexuality. See, the, the original Hebrew and Greek in the Bible has not changed. And the original Hebrew and Greek speakers who knew it fluently because they lived in that culture knew it a little bit better than modern Greek and Hebrew students do. Nothing has changed in the biblical text, but our culture has, and now somehow, almost miraculously, we now have the proper readings of the biblical text in the Queen James Bible. So we have gay theology where Jesus was pitted against Paul, where in the Old Testament, Sodom was destroyed not for um, homosexuality, but for inhospitality or maybe idolatry. Um, in Romans 1, where men swapped their natural orientation for women, for other men, it was looked at as, no, uh, some men who have an orientation for other men were being coerced by the society to go after women, and that in itself was wrong. And so you have all these new cultural impositions on the text, we call that eisegesis, rather than the, letting the text lead out and interpret culture. So we interpret scripture by means of sociology and culture, rather than interpreting culture by means of theology and scripture. The argument from compassion continues, maybe the argument from science here. Uh, homosexuality is not just ungodly, but also unnatural. In nature, uh, we have genotype traits, we have phenotype traits. The phenotype traits are those on the surface, the, the appearances, uh, not getting into the deep seatedness of, of the gene itself. In 2004, we mapped the human genome, the entire thing, and there was never found to be a gay gene. In the last two years, Science Magazine has come forth with the most comprehensive study, and there is no gay gene. Now, there are phenotype traits that are appearances, maybe a penis and a vagina, for example, right? These are the natural parts that come from uh, the genetics. And there are some very few genetic abnormalities um, called intersex that we'll get to later. But in the rhetoric with all of this about nature, you have sometimes in the queer or gay male li literature saying one thing, I was born that way. And in the lesbian literature, a something of a different nuance don't tell me I was born that way. I choose not to sleep with the enemy. Um, but what about these issues of being a cheater and a pedophile and a zoophile and a necrophiliac? Look, there are some species that actually have sex with the dead, like crows, for example. So because they do that and have a desire or have an orientation or have a preference to do that, does that mean crows ought to do that? There are some humans who like to dig up graves too. I think that happened to Marilyn Monroe. Does that mean there's now a natural sexual orientation to necrophilia? Some people like animals. In fact, it's now illegal in 48 out of 50 states, barring New Mexico and West Virginia, 
But why do we even have to make it illegal? We have to because it's still practiced. In fact, Hawaii, when they passed the law eight months ago, it's because their congressional rep said, we have to deal with this. We're becoming a major destination. People know that it's legal here. This happens. Well, if that's your orientation, if that's your desire, if that's your preference, you may have been born that way. I'm not going to say you weren't. You're born with certain desires, but that doesn't mean those desires are desirable, right? You're born with a desire. I just happen to like the color blue. I'm just attracted to it. That doesn't mean I can't eventually change favorite colors. But I don't choose my favorite color. I don't just say I'm going to choose blue today. No, I just find myself attracted to it. I'm just oriented to it. I'm just desiring it. Some of those things are harmless, like favorite colors. I also desire chocolate, dark chocolate in particular. In moderation, it's fine. But too much of it, I have to go on a 40 pound diet, right? There are some desires that are not desirable and that are actually harmful. Cheating may be desired by a whole lot of people. Sex with kids may be desired by a whole lot of people, with animals, with dead things, whatever. Just because I have an orientation, a preference, a desire, does not mean we ought to make public policy on it. It does not mean that it's good, not even for the individual per se. And so our orientation, our desires, our preferences, our attraction, uh, orientation toward blondes or to chocolate or blue are not genetically determined, but they may have heritable cha- traits that are genetic, but it doesn't mean I'm determined and I have to go cheat. Honey, just wait right here. I know it's Valentine's Day. It's our date night, but just wait right here. This pretty hot thing. I like blondes. You're not a blonde anymore. Um, I'll just be right back in a couple hours. That's my truth. That's my desire. Really? I'm not forced to do that. Or I like little kids. So just have them back by midnight. We understand you have desires and you need to be happy. Genetic determination are things like your eye color, your skin, And heritable traits are like predispositions, and they're not identical. A gene coding for seven feet tall isn't a basketball gene, although it is a genetic factor that makes one predisposed to be a basketball player much more than someone who is four feet tall. But it's not a basketball gene that forces you to go play basketball like a robot. So when we say we're born that way, We might say there are genetic factors, right, that go into making me want multiple women or want same sex or want minors or want animals or want chocolate and not strawberry. But that's just desires. Those are just preferences. And some of them are innocent and some of them are just, well, downright harmful. And so this is where we get to the next step from ungodly too unhealthy or too unnatural to unhealthy. And I would say that for the sake of argument, suppose God doesn't exist, the same argument can be made that it's not natural. On an evolutionary basis, nature would select for those genes that have survival adaptivity, that you're able to reproduce. Well, homosexuality does not enable one to reproduce. Not only does it fail on the survival of the fittest note, but it also positively hurts and even kills. And so, God or no God, rectal intercourse is demonstratively harmful, both, and I'm saying this, I know there are some younger kids here, and you can leave, or uh, parents can have them leave, or or as best I can, I'll speak in code, but this is like a health class. Someone said, will this be kid-friendly? And I thought, well, um, compared to what they're teaching in, in some schools that's going to harm them, This is much more healthy and therefore friendly for them, but I'm talking medicinally now. I'm talking about health here. I'm talking about medical practice. This is a biomedical issue that entails biomedical ethics. And so I'm gonna be very candid and this room is for adults. 
It's demonstratively harmful both on the penis from fecal bacteria and especially on the rectum. And so those are called toppers and bottomers in the literature. You think about this, just naturally think about this. If you've ever gone bowling, you go get a 10 pound bowling ball. That seems pretty light for bowling. But now think about giving birth to a 10 pound baby. That's a pretty big baby, but many women do that, right? And it's because there is designed this elasticity with the vagina that does not exist with the anus because there is this muscle called the sphincter that doesn't have that elasticity. It's not designed for that. It can't stretch like that. And in fact, just to be candid, the activity to do something like that, to pump out a 10 pound bowling ball there, um, or to have rough intercourse brings new meaning to rip you a new one. And that's exactly what happens. And it's not only because of uh, the tearing of the sphincter, but also because of the fact that the vagina has a double membrane lining where the um, mucus in the anal cavity is very thin, like single lining. And so it makes it that much more likely when rough activity is taking place to rip and tear and shred. Well, all of that combines with bacteria, bad bacteria in the anus, as opposed to certain good bacteria in the vagina, to get, in, get into the bloodstream. And it enables STIs or STDs to get into the bloodstream. And so even apart from AIDS, HIV, the New York Times once said that the average homosexual male is a tropical island of venereal diseases. The average homosexual male dies 10 to 30 years earlier than the heterosexual counterpart. Now, this is not a discriminatory argument. This is not a homophobic argument because this applies equally from men to men as it does men to women who are increasing in practice of this. And so you can take a monogamous, uh, faithful Christian couple, if they're practicing this, they ought not to. Because love wills the good of the other. And once you understand the biomedical aspects of this, you want to stop this because you don't want to harm, but to help the other. Remember, marriage is not about me, it's about we. And it's about serving the other, not serving self. So this is not a homophobic argument. This is a non-discriminatory argument. This is simply the science. Just listen to the science. At her TED Talk, Lisa Diamond, who is one of the most prominent APA Association of Psychological, or the American Psychological Association, one of the most prominent research professors in that association, and the, um, I forget the, uh, the book that she is co-editor of, uh, but she's one of the most prominent researchers. She is an avowed lesbian and feminist. She gave a lecture, you can go look at it on YouTube, I, I really encourage you to, or you can look at this TED Talk, which is, as TED Talks go, about 15 minutes. And in this 2018 TED Talk, um, she says, as a community, the queers have to stop saying, please help us. We're born this way and we can't change. And by queer, she means male homosexuals, not female. As an argument for legal standing. I don't think we need that argument, and that argument is going to bite us in the eh. Because now we know that there's enough data out there, and that the other side is aware of as much as we are aware of it. It's the science. She argues for gender fluidity, as well as many others now are arguing for. The reason why they couch the born that way argument is to take on victim status and sell, say, help, I can't change. Many have changed. 
And if they can't change, that blows the Christian message out of the water because change comes from the Greek word metanoia, to change one's mind, to repent. And what's good for the gay goose is good for the gay gander. We're going to have to give the same uh, license to adulterers, cheaters, bank robbers. Um, you name the sin. We just say, I couldn't help it. My desires. That's my truth. That's my desire. That's my, my preference. She goes on in, in her TED Talk to say, either we are a society that protects and defends all individual sexual autonomy, or we are not. That's what it comes down to. Either we're going to protect sexual autonomy, which is pansexuality, polyamory, and to each their own, or we're not. Well, okay, Dr. Diamond, does that go for people who say, I like Johnny, who want to be part of the pride parades, NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association? Are we going to protect and defend all individual sexual autonomy, or are we not? See, everybody has their line, so is she a bigot? We could talk also about the estimated new cases of HIV, and you can go check the CDC today. The same kind of stats are there today as there would have been 10 years ago, 20 or 30 years ago. Whereas AIDS HIV began predominantly with male homosexuals, it continues to be there. Now, heterosexuals get it a lot as well, but there's a whole lot more heterosexuals, and so proportionally they should be. But still, the overwhelming number of those who contract AIDS HIV or HIV AIDS are homosexuals because of what rectal intercourse is. It's part of the biomedical aspect. You can move on from here and talk about how this is unhealthy. Um, the death rate of new HIV diagnosis among MSM or male sex with male is more than 44 times that of non-MSM men. That's huge. Is that really something we want to have compassion on male homosexuals? and push them to an early deathbed, buy them a bag of cocaine. The death rate is approximately 20 years earlier than M, uh, among MSM than non-MSM men. Go home tonight and look up the CDC stats on this stuff. The health concern doesn't discriminate sexes. It would be the same thing, male to female, if the practice was as frequent. Rectal intercourse is equally harmful for the same biomedical reasons, whether a monogamous, uh, monogamous faithful Christian couple or an atheist MSM couple. It doesn't matter. It does not discriminate. It's just anatomy and physiology. It's just the science. Now, further, we can move on and talk about being uneconomical this isn't as powerful for some, but for others it might be, who say, look, I don't care unless it affects me. Well, it does affect you when it comes to public policy because in 2015, for example, there was $600 million given for research uh, prevention of AIDS, HIV with 6,700 deaths. By contrast, $554 million for breast cancer research with 40,000 deaths. And so proportionately, we are giving more money to rectal intercourse outcomes than we are to breast cancer patients who acquire breast cancer to no fault of their own. Why do we do that? Why do we discriminate against women? Does this hate homosexual males, this propaganda, this political truth, and hate women, females? We do it because there is political truth. There is a narrative. There is a sacred cow. And that's why. The bottom line here is that the Bible's right. God frowns on homosexuality, but why? Because he hates them? No, because he, contrary to many people in our culture, actually loves them. He's not the homophobe, neither are those parroting what God has said. 
It's those who call others homophobes who actually celebrate, not with a bag of cocaine, but with the early death sentence of rectal intercourse. It's unloving because it's first ungodly, unnatural, whether or not God exists, it's unnatural. It's unhealthy, consequently, and it's uneconomical. But it's unloving, it's homophobic, and unfair to promote a public policy whose lifestyle is demonstratively harmful to both individuals and society. We discriminate against smokers, against motorcycle riders, against people who jump out of airplanes, against people who have this or that. Why? Because of risk assessment. Why don't we likewise do it here? And you know why. Look, one can tell the truth without love, like, say, the Westboro Baptist Church, who said, God hates fags. Well, first of all, I don't think that's even true, but it's not loving either, and it's not going to get you converts or people persuaded. One can tell the truth without love, but one cannot love without telling the truth. So we move into trans everything then. What about trans rights? Was Lady Gaga, who said born that way, was she mistaken that God makes no mistakes? Because see, the trans community and the lesbian or gay community, which says I'm born this way, says no, I'm a mistake. I'm supposed to be a female in a male body. And trans rights are supposed to be human rights now. And in our culture, homosexuality is sort of passe. What's now in vogue is trans. And so now you start to see this is becoming popular. It's becoming faddish. And so middle school and high school students now want to come out and do this for attention because it's cool. It's actually cool. There's no, there's no taboo on it anymore. Still a taboo on animals. You don't want to get caught doing that, but a lot of people do it. Or with the dead, people do it. But there's no taboo here anymore. It's popular. And in fact, it's Supreme Court law. When I say trans everything, I mean transgender denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex. One is biology, one is psychology. Or transageism, someone who feels he or she is a child trapped in an adult's body. Or transracialism, individuals who claim to have racial identity that differs from their birth race. Or transableism, becoming disabled by choice, chopping off an arm, making yourself blind. Disabled by choice, not chance. Transabled people feel like imposters in their fully working bodies. Or trans species, the unreal world in which humans pretend to be animals, claiming that they are actually animals trapped in a human body. Now, lest this sound like theory, they're all real cases. Up at the top left, you have a transgender female to male or male to female, a mistake. I was born a mistake. I was supposed to be born with the proper body matching my proper psychology. I was born a mistake. I'm supposed to be younger. And someone in Europe sued to claim he was 16 when he was in his 50s. Or Rachel Dolezal here, who claimed to be black who went to Howard College in Washington, D.C., an all-black college, who got a master's degree from there, who was the president of our NAACP chapter until her biological parents outed her and showed a picture. She's white. And she said, well, I just, I feel black, right? Or people that have lost their limbs, their arms, their legs, or whatever. You can go YouTube this. And you can listen to the stories of people who, at the behest of their psychologist, went ahead and put Drano in their eyes and went blind. You can listen to their stories today. This is real stuff. And there are surgeons out there who are willing to take money to chop off a limb to make you feel happy because you need to be happy and content. 
and you don't feel like you really have two legs. Or plastic surgery on your body to be a beast because you feel like a goat or a cat or a dog or whatever. These aren't just theory. These are various dysphoria that people wrestle with. Now, not all of them are faddish, but that doesn't change it. And so this is where Richard Dawkins, the uh, famous neo-atheist, came out last year and said, I don't understand why if a person can claim to identify as male when they're female or vice versa, why someone like Rachel Dolezal can't be offered the same liberties and freedoms of claiming to be black when she's white. And for that, the Humanist Society that gave him an award 25 years ago for his work in atheism and humanism took the award away. And he went on the apology tour. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to harm anyone. They didn't forgive. <laughs> he found out very quickly. I want to tell you a story. I learned as I was reading a major psychology textbook in its seventh edition used by Indiana University in psychology majors. This is David Reimer. He began as Bruce, not Bruce Jenner, but Bruce Reimer. He was born a twin with another brother. But when the circumcision took place, it was a botched operation and they made his penis look unrecognizable. And so a doctor who had personal interests in furthering the idea that we can socialize biology and gender is a social construct, sex is a social construct, not biological, encouraged the parents who then at 17 months old took Bruce then and did surgery and made Bruce now Brenda, not Caitlyn Jenner, but Brenda. This is back in the early 1960s. And they gave um, hormones and so forth and bought dresses and dolls and, you know, girl things. It never took. It never worked, even with the hormones. Brenda would try to urinate standing up. Brenda would rip off the dresses and want boy clothes on. Brenda would want to play with her twin brother with his toys. He, he wouldn't let her. She would get mad. She eventually saved up her own money to buy a toy truck. Finally, Brenda's 14 years old, a teenager, struggling, suicidal with all of this stuff, and goes and has an appointment with an endocrinologist. Shares with this person that she feels like she was really a he. One thing led to another. Eventually, she got the surgery, started pumping male hormones. And Bruce, Brenda, then became David. And David's father then told him what happened at birth and what happened at a year and a half old. And now he's just totally discombobulated, frustrated, angry, hurt, depressed. But he continued on for almost another decade when he was 25. David got married. That's a picture of his wife, who had a previous marriage and kids, and he adopted the kids. And in 2000, David um, went public with this because he wanted no one else to have to go through the pain that he went through. And it was all over the news. 2004, he just couldn't take it anymore, and he committed suicide. That's David Reimer. That's Bruce, not Jenner, but Reimer with his twin brother. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this video. But briefly, talking about you know, the problems of, sorry, no, skip someone back there. There we go. Sorry. Um, the problems of the Christian treatment of homosexuality are two. We sometimes operate with the bash and the dash approach. The bash approach is you take the biggest Bible you can and you whack them over the head. 
That's not Christian. That's not our approach. The dash approach is, hey, no one in here but us chickens. There's no problem here. <whistles> nothing biblical, nothing scientific, nothing biomedical, nothing harmful. So the bash approach is practiced by people like the Westboro Baptist Church, an unloving example that the media takes and then vomits all over the rest of us and says this is what Christianity does. And recently in this city, they tried to pass laws against doing it at the charge of $1,000 per day for trying to encourage someone who might come and ask you that you could give them a biblical picture of change or a biomedical argument for why you could and should change. Yeah, porn's a big problem. It's in the church today. I get that. My gay friend, gay cleric, once said, I like to tell people that in the Bible there's only six places where it talks about homosexuality, but about 600 where it talks about fornication among heterosexuals. And porn might be a major, if not the major, problem in the church, destroying people, marriages, families, and the whole lot. But it doesn't mean that that makes homosexuality right. We need to put a, a, a wrap on both of those. Divorce is a problem too. That's a black eye in the church. We need to put a wrap on that as well. But bad examples don't mean that there are no good examples. And a black eye doesn't mean a log in the eye. That you can't say anything. The dash approach isn't the problem of the love. It's the problem of the truth. And in one sense, it kind of is a problem with the love as well. You say nothing because truth creates conflict and it generates non-likes. And in our culture, we all want to be liked. We want to see how many likes we can get on a social media post. You can tell the truth without love, but you cannot love without telling the truth. And so those who do not tell the biomedical truth about this are homophobic, unloving, and hateful. The Bible, reason, nature, and empathy. Enough homophobia. We need to love homosexuals. We encourage you to go to our website at ratiochristi.org. Soon we'll have a booklet there by one of our staff who is former lesbian as well. And you can research further issues there and consider these things more. You see, what the Bible says, nature says. The same God who, who is author of Scripture is the author of nature. These are the two books of God, Scripture and nature, God's Word and God's work. Sometimes there can be conflict, not at the level of the facts themselves, but at the level of the interpretation of the facts, be it theological or scientific. Thank you. I don't know if we have some time for questions, but if uh, people want to ask questions. Yes. What is the LGBTQ, IIQ, all of those? So, uh, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, questioning, intersex. Oh, I forgot to mention that. I've got to go back. Intersex. Um, ally and yeah, I forget the other one. You could put P on there for pansexual too, but uh, perhaps I, I think a asexual. Um, a intersex. I, I alluded to it earlier on, but I probably need to say something about it. Intersex is a reality. It's a biological and genetic abnormality where someone might have um, you know, female genes and somehow there is, you know, male gonads or something like that, or female ovaries. And so there's a mix there. There's a problem there, right? Well, how do we deal with that? Well, one question is practical. How do we deal with it as a society? How would a surgeon deal with that? And I have had a friend that would do those operations, and he said he would always lean into the genetics because the genes are always going to drive the person like Bruce, not Jenner, but Reimer. Um, and so he would always go that way, the genotype, not the phenotype in, in the surgical operations. But how do we, how do we rapple, uh, wrestle with that theologically? 
Well, the same way we do with blindness. You know, teacher, was this man or his parents sinner, uh, sinning for the, him to be born blind? Neither, but so that God can work his way, blah, 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 blah. In this world, since Genesis 3, since the fall, there has been corruption uh, on a deep level and on a broad level throughout so that people have corruptions. They have defects, not just morally, but genetically and biologically. And so in the same way that we would handle theologically, uh, what about blind people? What about volcanoes or you know, natural disasters and so forth? What about cancer? Likewise, we would handle intersex in that same way, theologically, theoretically, and operationally, practically. I think my friend was on the right direction. Uh, what else? Yeah. I remember meeting a Catholic priest my first year of marriage. We were in this dorm at Yellowstone National Park. My wife and I, as soon as we got married, we went up. We were waiters and waitresses for the summer. And I was in the bathroom. We had these co-ed bathrooms, right? There's this Catholic priest getting ready next to me in the mirror, and we were talking. And somehow this came up. And he, he was, oh, yeah, there are geese in Canada that are gay, blah, 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 blah. Well, look, there are also dogs who like fire hydrants or legs. <laughs> That doesn't mean it's its sexual orientation. Now, now we need to say that we have to have a category for horn dogs, you know, to, to go after legs. No, or Peter or Peter Singer at Princeton, um, the New York or the uh, San Francisco Chronicle uh, summarized his view of animals is that you you can't eat them, but you can have sex with them. His article called "Dearest Pet," right? Now, if you say, ooh, you're just guilty of a form of discrimination, much like sexism and racism, and it's called speciesism. The only reason you do that is because you've got this not just ethnocentric, but this uh, humanocentric um, discriminatory tone about yourself. You tend to think humans are privileged. Hmm? Privileged white people, privileged males, privileged humans. In reality, um, some we, we ought to kill certain babies that are deformed and allow certain full-grown, you know, pigs to, to live. We can have sex with animals, we just can't eat them. Look, you've got all kinds of illustrations of fruit flies or ducks or crows who literally, go look this one up too, have sex with their dead. What about the crows who have sex with their dead? Well, I guess that's a sexual orientation Facebook needs now as well, right? <laughs> and it wasn't just crows. By golly, they actually did that to Marilyn Monroe. So I guess now we need to have a category for that too. And sorry, you may have just buried grandma, but you need to loan her out now. I would handle the fruit fly thing in just the same way. <laughs> Natural selection selects for survival adaptivity. Evolution says the strong survive. Just because there are monsters out there or defects or corruptions doesn't mean those things are considered normal or normative. Yeah. I don't remember, frankly, but there is one for MAP as well. And they keep trying to enter MAP in to the pride flags. And it'll be there eventually. I mean, it was part of the Greco-Roman culture, right? I mean, uh, Pericles was thought to be odd because he didn't have an interest in boys. So, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not in vogue right now. It will be. You think that's crazy, but in Florida, just, you know, a couple of months ago, a teacher on the school board took the seventh grade, second grade kids on a field trip to a gay bar. Then Babylon B joked about it two years prior to that, <laughs> it predicted and came true. There are people who really do want our children. Any other questions? I think, I think one thing is helpful. Remember, this is for those in the synagogue. Not everyone's going to buy this, and they're just going to think you're a backwoodsy, you know, Kentuckian religious person or something like that. 
you need to follow Paul's model and be able to reason with people on their level. To the Greek, I become a Greek. To the Jew, I become a Jew, so that by all means I can save some, right? And you need to think about that illustration of cocaineophobia and think about it hard, how to use that as a disclaimer. When I debated a homosexual philosopher many years ago, I used that at the beginning of my debate because anytime you have a conversation with someone about this, if they're either neutral or endorsing, you're already a bigot. You already are. So unless you can turn the table, if you can switch the rhetoric around and recapture the argument from compassion, right, then it's going to be an uphill battle in having the conversation. The cocaineophobia is a good illustration uh, because one is indifferent, live and let live, to each his own. It's all about love. Love is love. The other one is celebrate, hate or celebrate, right? And those aren't the only two options. But, okay, let's say they are. Well, guess what? You're hating if you're buying the bag of cocaine. You're hating if you're encouraging an early deathbed. The other one's indifferent. There's got to be a third option, and it just comes back to the classical position, namely, you hate the sinner, or you love the sinner, and you hate the sin. All right, well, thank you.